Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast. A podcast of Wheaton College. Throughout the chapter that I write on Sayers, there is a sense in which um, her, her works are a kind of haunting. Mm-hmm. Right? They, they're, they can be scary. <laughs> what was creepy is his delivery had no emotion to it. They said he oh, would just right? look straight ahead at the bell rope, and they said he would stare the bell rope off. He wouldn't throw any emotional manipulation into oh, it. He wow. would just deliver it very deadpan. But they said that was even more chilling <laughs> than uh, if he threw a lot of emotion into his description. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Man. Hello, this is Crystal Downing, and David, my co-director at The Wade, has joined me for a conversation with Jim Beitler, who has produced a fascinating work called Seasoned Speech. And we have someone else joining us, our wonderful producer of The Wade podcast, Aaron Hill. Thank you, Aaron, for joining us. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And Jim, I... As you know, I'm quite excited about your book. I can't say anything negative about it because I wrote a positive blurb that (laughs) appears on the back of the book. But why don't you start by talking about the significance of the title of your book, Seasoned Speech. Great. Thank you so much for having me. It's just a real delight uh, to do this. Um, The the book's title uh, comes uh, from a passage in Colossians. In which Paul talks about having our speech be seasoned with salt, um, and so in in some ways the title is riffing on uh, that verse, um, because um, one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is think about the ways in which the rhetorical tradition, a very rich tradition indeed, can inform our practices uh, as Christians and how we witness to the truth of the gospel. And so Paul, in some ways, is talking about um, talking about that, and it sounds a lot like um, eloquence, making the mm. truth eloquent. Um, but that's not all rhetoric can do. It's not just about um, making our words more flowery and beautiful. Um, there's a depth uh, to what the rhetorical tradition can offer Christians who want to speak the truth. And so I'm not just using the word seasoning or seasoned speech to talk about the ways that we can make our language more beautiful or more eloquent or kind of uh, more uh, style, stylistically artful. I'm also interested in the ways in which uh, we can think about um, our tradition as providing a kind of seasoning uh, for um, our, our practice. So thinking about um, the ways in which our words are matured or fit for use. Um, so the seasons of the church year uh, become a resource, as I talk about it in the book, uh, for thinking about our own speech. So what do our kind of traditions as Christians have to offer us as Christians who want to be rhetoricians as well? Mm. And one of the reasons we're interviewing Jim for the Wade podcast is he has one chapter dedicated to the rhetoric of C.S. Lewis and another chapter dedicated to the rhetoric of Dorothy Sayers. So he uses those two people archived here at the Wade as exemplars of powerful rhetoric. And indeed, I did a lot of research, especially for the Sayers chapter here at the Wade. Um, I found some just really wonderful letters, um, one of which is in the book. So yeah, so great, great resource. is a pun. It, so you're being rhetorical. <laughs> yes. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Well, that's why it is, I think it's so brilliant because Paul himself uses puns. Like when he's talking about um, in 1 Corinthians, the night at which Jesus was betrayed, he handed over to his disciples the idea of the Last Supper. This is my body. This is the, my bread. But he's punning mm. on the term betrayed and handing over because they both come from the exact same Greek root, which means handing over. And that's what a tradition is, something you hand over. But that's why our word tradition is like the word traitor, traduce. Anyway, Mm, even rhetorical puns are employed in Mm. scripture. So, Well, and Jim, you mentioned in the book that, uh, you know, Paul talks about this, but then in other places, his language is um, 
very lofty. And I mean, people often look to Paul for the kind of language that he has that is very rhetorical. So it seems that sometimes it's like people use that verse to say we shouldn't use that kind of speech, but it's being spoken by a New Testament author who is clearly doing that in the rest of his writings. I mean, you look exactly at right. Colossians 1 mm-hmm. and other places in the New Testament. So, yeah. Why do you think the word rhetoric has such a bad rap? People can say eloquence, which is good, or they can say persuasion, which is at least neutral. Mm. But when you hear the word rhetoric, people always think empty rhetoric. You mentioned that outside That's only rhetorical. Right. Yeah. Uh, Outside of academia, it's always had that negative connotation. Do you have a theory about that? Well, I think it's partly its history. Um, So it's connection with the sophists um, and the kind of notion that it would be uh, making the the kind of untruthful argument seem appealing, um, mm. and so there's that that connection, um, and then um, it, you know there's a kind of long history of uh, rhetoric kind of being up and down uh, in in um, the eyes of various publics, um, but uh, Peter Peter Ramos, um, one of the things that I was taught is uh, that uh, Peter Ramos uh, kind of famously. Um, reduced rhetoric from mm-hmm. a five canons to essentially um, two um, style and uh, delivery um, and gave all the good stuff to dialectic, uh, mm-hmm. to philosophy. Oh. Um, so that was mm-hmm. part of it too. So there, there, there are those moves uh, throughout history as well. And then there's th- just the problem of contemporary usage. Um, so we hear that a lot um, on the news that this is, you know, that so-and-so politician is just speaking um, using empty rhetoric or something like that. Mm -hmm. So all of these uh, factors kind of contribute to uh, a real um, kind of negative view of rhetoric at times, but it's this rich tradition that offers us resources for speaking. Um, And as Augustine says, you know, we should use it um, to convey the truth um, Mm -hmm. because it's being used to convey falsehood. Mm-hmm. And he's so rhetorically effective himself. You mentioned in, early in your book that he's another one who said, I'm not going to allow my teaching to be used by people for their, uh, you know, s- sullied purposes. But yes. that his the Confessions is full of beautiful rhetoric. Oh, yes. I mean, these whole sections on addressing God directly like the psalmist. Yeah. And the same thing with Paul. When you look at the love chapter in Corinthians or put on the whole armor of God, those are extremely sophisticated rhetorical devices. Yeah. So, so when he says, I came not to you in, in lofty words, I wonder if they scratch their heads. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Augustine, uh, in his text on Christian doctrine, explicitly talks about signs and the difference between natural signs, culturally constructed signs. He was very self-conscious about the way we use signifiers to communicate the truth. And so what I like about your book, Jim, is that you show multiple examples of different kinds of Christian rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So in addition to Sayers and Lewis, why don't you list the other authors you researched and then explain why you chose them? Sure. Thank you. So um, the first two chapters are, as you said, about Lewis and Sayers. And then the third chapter is about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, The fourth chapter is about um, the Archbishop of South Africa, Desmond Tutu. And the fifth chapter is about Marilyn Robinson, a writer, novelist. Um, I chose the five figures because I thought they did a really nice job of, first of all, um, illustrating different um, important concepts from the rhetorical tradition, all related to the concept of ethos, kind of credibility or character of a speaker. Um, So that was part of the reason I chose uh, the figures. I also just chose them, to be honest, because they were people that I wanted to think and write more about. Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, Mm -hmm. so these are um, just wonderful communicators, but they don't, they're not often talked about as rhetoricians, Mm -hmm. Um, but they are, Uh, they Mm -hmm. all are rhetoricians. And so um, using these five figures who are beloved uh, communicators to think um, and kind of advocate for the rhetorical tradition was important to me. Mm. And then finally, um, it had to do with the seasons. So each of the chapters maps onto a different season of the church year. So the Lewis chapter is about Advent, Sayers about Christmas, and so on. And so I thought the the figures lined up nicely with the respective seasons that I put them in mm. as well. Um, 
That's not to say that I want to pigeonhole the figures. I think they all exemplify the witness of particular seasons of the church year. Um, but I do think um, they do a nice job um, in the chapters that I've placed mm-hmm. them. Well, that's what struck me is that you're practicing what you're preaching in so mm-hmm. far by punning on this word seasoned speech and using the seasons as a type of rhetorical thread Mm. to attach all these writers when really they are very different. So it was a clever way to present your material. Thank you. Did you try another level of seasoning with uh, some, one was salt, one was pepper? That would probably be. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Couldn't make Cumin. that one work. Right? Paprika. <laughs> yeah, paprika. <laughs> uh, Jim, in the book, you mentioned uh, that we need to, you said, uh, quote, we need to extend existing conversations about the ways that Christian liturgies shape the character of individuals and societies. And you talk about how that shapes our, our ethos. Um, and I, it seems to me that the church calendar and the liturgies is something that we associate with um, sort of an inward function. You know, it it, it disciples, it sort of forms a, a catechesis, it shapes us as Christians. Um, and you mention in the book about trying to create a place where people feel like they can find a home in the church through the church calendar and things like that. Uh, and I totally sympathize with that. And you mentioned James K. Smith and the liturgies, but it seems to me that we, we live in a culture where people are increasingly being shaped by liturgies from outside of the church. And that's kind of when one of you mentioned in the book, uh, Smith's thesis related to that. So one of the questions I had for you was how do we address that? How do we address that rhetoric? Um, is it that we re-emphasize the things within the church? We make people aware of how these liturgies shape our own character and our uh, Christian formation? How do we address that? Because it seems like it's a, a rhetoric that's operating behind the scenes that we're not aware of. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, part of it is uh, that um, liturgies just need to do their work on us. So I, I think that's that's part of it. We need to be in church, <laughs> uh, yeah. as, essentially. <laughs> yeah. So that, uh, that's really important. That's um, partly what Smith is is talking about. Mm-hmm. Like we need to allow uh, these uh, uh, our our formation to happen through these kind of Christian uh, liturgies, as opposed to the cultural some cultural liturgies. Um, but I don't think that's it. I mean, I I do think that being transparent, more transparent with congregations about the the power of rhetoric and what it does and the ways in which our liturgical practices are rhetorical um, would help us uh, to uh, allow ourselves to be formed um, in particular ways. Um, so, you know, I, th- I think it, it, it's partly unconscious, but it, it can have this conscious uh, component where yeah. we actually n- need to do more kind of teaching in the church about what rhetoric can offer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then also just thinking about, um, I, you know, I think as I, as I mentioned toward the end of the book, um, and many people have talked about besides, besides me, I, I think the distinction between worship and witness is important. It does some good things uh, for us. Mm. Um, but it, it can also uh, be overly emphasized. Um, and so part of what this book is trying to do is, is to say, Worship is very much a rhetorical practice that's not just about character formation, but about um, rhetorical character formation, mm. the formation of our own uh, rhetorical character in the world. Um, so there's um, what James Smith talks about is both um, centrifugal and centripetal dynamics at play mm. when we're talking about worship. Mm-hmm. Another book that I thought of that along these same lines is Gerald Mast's book called Go to Church, Change the World. Mm -hmm. And he's coming out of an Anabaptist tradition where community is essential. And I think a lot of us grew up in this Protestant tradition where it's all about our autonomous relationship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. And there isn't that emphasis Mm -hmm. on the the rhetoric of liturgy that mm. shapes us. Well, uh, where I come from in the South, uh, you know, you mentioned like Advent and all those things. Like uh, we don't have Advent in the South. We have bowl season uh, with college football. <laughs> and there's oh. all these, I mean, I'm <laughs> yeah. serious, you know, and uh, and one of the figures here at the Wade Center and uh, one of your chapters is on Dorothy Sayers, you know, and she, she had a career uh, in advertising. And it seems like advertising and all these sorts of things are, mm. 
performing a rhetorical function on us. And uh, one of the functions of rhetoric is to kind of create community through these sort of shared symbols. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like we all of these symbols and these things, we're being seasoned by all of these things yes. from the world. And that in, is shaping our character in, in ways that you know, so people in the South, they're in church on Sunday, but they're at the, you know, they're at the college football stadium on Saturday. And sometimes mm -hmm. that is shaping and In fact, them. while they're in their church, they're still at yeah, the, yeah. Mm -hmm. they're getting updates. The yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, uh, that, that does bring up a good point. I, in, in some ways, the, um, I go to an Anglican church and the book has kind of an Anglican flavor, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. to it. Appropriate, especially for <laughs> Lewis and Sayers. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so not all the figures are, of course, are um, Anglican, but there's that there's that flavor to the book, and I, I do think it's important to emphasize that I'm not claiming that um, this is the only way or the best way that we uh, can have our se speech seasoned. Um, so um, other uh, denominations, other traditions have their own liturgies. Smith would say, and what. I'm trying to do is think about the ways in which um, that connection is important, um, kind of irrespective of what tradition you're a part of. So if you're Southern Baptist, you have liturgy. Um, it just yeah. looks different. Mm -hmm. And so thinking about the ways in which your liturgy is forming you for work in the world is what I'm trying to prompt us to think more about. Um, so I don't want to suggest that it just is all about being Anglican. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Doesn't the word liturgy mean people work? Work of the people is some, of, so, sometimes yeah. how it gets yeah. translated. Somehow you're supposed to be involved in the work of worship. You're not supposed to be just the audience watching the people up front. That's right. Mm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Can I go back to Lewis and uh, ethos? You talked about good sense uh, and good character and goodwill in your chapter on Lewis. Sometimes I think when people talk about social skills or rhetorical skills, they're acting as if you can acquire them like driving skills or typing skills. But a lot of ethos comes out of your character. Mm -hmm. uh, I've actually noticed that some students who have poor social skills in peer editing or in the classroom they have difficulty writing because they don't see things from the reader's point of view. Mm. And that's actually a character issue. If you don't develop empathy, mm. uh, you won't be able to anticipate how a reader is responding to your writing. Lewis is great. You have an example where he just says in second person, you know, we don't know when the Lord's going to return. It might happen before you finish reading oh. this page. Mm. And love, you, the reader, passage, yeah, yeah. you go, whoa, that's, <laughs> but he, he does that very well. He says, now, right now you might be thinking, oh, this fellow has all these ingenious arguments for miracles, but does he, and you go, that is what I was thinking. So in a way, I think his ethos, it is a rhetorical skill, but it's one that's embedded in that character and that ability to read other minds, to have empathy. Um, so I think the question of what is dialectic and what is rhetoric is very difficult to divide into categories because often they're so connected. That's a good point. Yeah, it makes me think of um, something else that I talk about in the book, and that is Lewis's um, kind of deep care and concern for the audience members to whom he was addressing mm -hmm. and a kind of willingness to try to find out more about them. Um, and it speaks to that notion of empathy uh, that you're talking about. Um, and, and that's what ultimately allows him to be rhetorical because he actually cares about these people um, in a very profound way. He cares about them um, as, as eternal beings. Uh, mm -hmm. So. Uh, in the chapter on Lewis, you note that um, one's ethos is sometimes tied to uh, who the writer appears to be to the audience, you know? And so there's a sense in which I think we all think very highly of Lewis. Obviously, we work here at the Wade Center, so that's, I think that's a job requirement. But um, <laughs> <laughs> some people think more highly of Lewis than others. Um, we've talked about, you know, hagiography and sort of St. Louis before. Um, to what extent do you think maybe... Um, that sort of plays into his ability to be persuasive and sort of continue to persuade and influence people. Um, because, you know, uh, I think we, th we assume that he has goodwill towards the audience. Um, but other people may not. We've spoken to some people here at the Wade Center that don't has, have as high a view. So what role do you think maybe, uh, cause it seems like that's a thing we see in today. Y you may have a, a politician or an individual in public and the audience attributes to them goodwill, 
where that may not actually be there uh, in reality. But if the audience attributes that to them, then that increases their persuasiveness with the audience. How do you see that relating to Lewis, maybe? I think it relates to, I would distinguish between two types of ethos. Uh, One is uh, intrinsic ethos and one is extrinsic ethos. So extrinsic Mm -hmm. ethos being the ethos that one brings due to their prior reputation. These aren't Mm -hmm. my definitions. Mm -hmm. It's outside of you. It's extrinsic. Intrinsic ethos is the ethos that's constructed within a text. Um, In the book, I am really trying to look at the ways in which Lewis constructs his ethos intrinsically. So how he's doing it through the words that he writes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in some ways I'm skirting Skirting around that, skirting around that issue that you, uh, Mm -hmm. um, perceptively raise, uh, you know, he, 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 he very quickly, after he became a Christian relatively became very famous. (laughs) Um, so he, you know, he was on time, the cover of time magazine, um, relatively soon after he became a Christian. Um, and, um, I think it's that, that piece where he is quoted as saying, you know, I never intended to be a hot gospeler. Um, you probably can, uh, mm-hmm. affir- affirm this better than I can, um, David, but, um, he, you know, he, so, I mean, I, I think it is an issue there, there, he does, he does get some credibility, um, from outside of himself as a result of reputation and things, um, things like that. Um, but. Um, he's also doing things in the text um, that uh, is building goodwill. Um, and I, I think that's what's important for us to focus on um, with him as a kind of model. Mm-hmm. I loved your one footnote that said, of course, C.S. Lewis was not perfect. <laughs> Good. We've got that down in print now. All right. right. Well, and Aaron's question about St. Louis made me suddenly realize how people have eviscerated often Lewis's rhetorical power, the, his intrinsic rhetorical power, by quoting out of context, much the way they will quote Bible verses out of context. So they proof text, appropriate a verse in order to support what they want to believe already. Mm. And I notice this being done with Lewis. So they'll take a statement out of the rhetorical context where he is building an argument and just say, well, Lewis says, and because it's Lewis, it's Mm -hmm. almost like saying, well, St. Paul says. Right, right. Yeah. um, You know, he he was finite and fallible and (laughs) everything that we are. Um, so he, you know, he, he can make mistakes, but he, he, he does do a remarkable job, um, in so much of what he writes. Um, at persuading and and doing it in a way that seems to have integrity, um, it really does. Mm-hmm. To what to I'm sorry. To what extent do you see that maybe uh, playing a role in so Dorothy Sayers? So in your chapter on Sayers, which uh, I really enjoyed. Also, how did you manage to make footnote sixty six be the comment about being sent to the outer darkness? I thought um, that, I don't know if that was a, <laughs> a weird thing or not. But uh, what was the context? It was you were commenting about the um, in the play where he gets sent into the outer darkness, yeah. and it was footnote sixty six. And I thought, how did you manage oh. that? Did not. There was no. There was no planning. <laughs> I've never thought of that. Six there <laughs> I know, but it still, more. it's like almost. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but so with Sayers, I mean, one of the things we've talked about, and we had a podcast recently uh, where Crystal, uh, we've talked with Christine Colon about Dorothy Sayers, is, you know, we wonder why maybe she's not more influential and people haven't seen her as more persuasive. And you mentioned in the book sort of some of her responses to letters that she received, some of which were pretty critical of her, and she was pretty straightforward with them. Paprika. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> she was uh, spicier Pepper. speech. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you see maybe the difference between uh, Sayers and, and Lewis with regard to um, that kind of goodwill towards their audience? I mean, not that Sayers didn't have that, but maybe the perception of that. Yeah. Well, you know, I... I I think, um, you know, Lewis says, um, not all things can we all do. And I think mm-hmm. that's a, just a really important, uh, important or writes that, um, it's a, just a really important lesson. Um, so Sayers doesn't need to be Lewis. Um, and Lewis mm-hmm. doesn't need to be mm-hmm. Sayers. Um, and, uh, Sayers did, uh, I'm sure practice goodwill at times, but I think she's, um, uh, much, 
uh, better exemplar of other kinds of rhetorical uh, strategies. Yeah. And sometimes practicing goodwill is just being forthright. And she mm-hmm. was, and she was mm-hmm. forthright. Yeah. Um, in all, especially in those letters that you're talking about, yeah. um, people would write criticisms to her, and she would respond um, bluntly uh, at times. Uh, but she was just trying to to speak the truth, I think. Um, mm-hmm. And so, and and that can be powerful um, as well. And so, I I see her um, witness in many cases as as just more more direct and more. Um, um, more forthright, I would say. Mm-hmm. Can you uh, amplify on the Greek term you used to describe uh, Sayer's rhetorical strategy? Yeah, energia or energeia, sometimes pronounced. Um, it's vivid depiction. Um, so um, there are a lot of ancient uh, rhetoricians that, t- that talk about it. Um, but the idea is that, um, and it comes from oratory, and the idea is that a speaker would imagine a situation that they're describing um, so, so vividly that it would almost take them, them, the speaker over. And through that, the audience would be persuaded. Um, so it mm-hmm. often was used in, in the courts um, in order to, in order to persuade um, the, the speaker would imagine a, a potential murderer, say uh, approaching their victim and they would be so overcome that, that would become convincing to the audience. Mm. Um, so uh, uh, I kind of use it to talk about the ways in which um, Sayers um, in her radio plays especially uh, relies on vivid depiction to move mm. an audience. Mm-hmm. And there's just some wonderful letters uh, in the Wade Center about that. Uh, mm. People who, um, who heard... Um, some of the radio plays would write in and say, I just can't believe, I, I felt like I was there. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like I was transported there. Um, it all, you made it seem so alive and so real, um, talking about the nativity in particular. So um, she was uh, particularly gifted at that. And, and part of the way she does that, I think, is uh, in He That Should Come, uh, especially. Um, she, she starts off, uh, talking with uh, having the three uh, the three three wise men are a kind of framing device uh, for uh, the the story of the nativity in Sayers' retelling of it, and she starts off by making the scene really blurry uh, for us. And as a reader, you're it's almost like she's asking us to turn on our imagination mm. in a way um, through this kind of lack of clarity, and then she kind of brings it into focus for us and gives us this uh, kind of vivid, vividly depicted uh, event in a kind of coarse uh, setting, a realistic uh, setting using language in the contemporary vernacular. And so she's really trying to, to, to show it to us vividly. Um, so she, she, it's, a, it's just really remarkable what she does. Mm-hmm. An old phrase for radio drama was theater of the mind. Theater of the mind, And yeah. the way you described that was like mm-hmm. theater of the mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Would you consider Jonathan Edwards' uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God to be the same rhetorical technique mm-hmm. for a different purpose? How would you describe the vivid depiction of you're a yes. spider over a fire and God's trying to decide whether or not to let go of the, yeah. the strand? I mean, seems, I, 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 that, that seems just... I, <laughs> I mean, there is a connection, but between the, the both ha, both uh, what Sayers is doing in some of her work and what Jonathan Edwards does is um, an, an appeal to pathos, mm-hmm. kind mm-hmm. of appeal to emotion and f- fear in, in particular. So, in, in, throughout that chapter that I write on Sayers, there is a sense in which um, her her works are a kind of haunting, mm-hmm. right? That they, they're they can be scary. Uh, so you know, you're sitting in Canterbury. Um, cathedral, um, watching this play that takes place, um, and it, it it can be a little bit frightening, um, mm-hmm. in terms of the way the stage is uh, set up. Um, but you know, I think um, Jonathan Edwards' uh, appeal to to fear might be a little bit more pronounced. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> what was creepy is his delivery had no emotion to it. They said he oh, would just right? look straight ahead at the bell rope and they said he would stare the bell rope off. He wouldn't throw any emotional manipulation into oh, it. He wow. would just deliver it very deadpan. But they said that was even more chilling <laughs> than uh if he threw a lot of emotion into his description. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Man. Well, you had talked about the importance of community earlier. 
And that is an emphasis of your book, these community celebrations through liturgy. And that really resonates with Sayers and makes your inclusion of her so appropriate because Sayers' commitment was definitely to the work itself, the imaginative work itself. Even though she talks about the importance of the power, for her, this, the famous line, Christian work is good work well done. And she at one moment said that she saw in theater all the stigmata, and she uses the word stigmata, all the stigmata of the Christian church. And because she was thinking that to put on a good play, every single person has to know the script they are honoring, but they each have a role. And so theater, any stage presentation is somewhat liturgical and they work together as a community and she was so committed to community she would get involved in ironing the costumes and sewing and mending she wasn't there going well i was the script writer <laughs> and you peons go do your peonesque stuff <laughs> it was about community because collaboratively they were putting together a work yes that's really that's really wonderful. Um, I, uh, one of the things that that um, what you were saying reminded me of is um, that f for Sayers, it seems to me, witness Christian witness, um, and you 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 know feel free to correct me on this or push back a little bit. Well, it wasn't so much about a personal avowal, um, right? And mm, and, right. I, and I think and I and, and those might not even be my words. Those might be uh, James Thurber's words. Um, but, um, but more about this kind of, um, practice of one's profession. Yes. Um, and of course, profession, it, one is tied to a guild, to a community. So it can be the theater, it could be whatever. Um, and then also, right. The other kind of profession, the yeah. profession of faith being the creed. Right. Um, so these two professions, and of course the creed also ties us, the saying of the creed ties us the creeds ties us to a larger community. Yes. Um, the yes. church at large. It expands. Yes. The, the theater. Yes. The theater. So it's not just what I say. Um, it's what we say and what we do together. Mm. Chris, you've also emphasized in the past that part of Sayer's mission was to get rid of jaded rhetoric or mm -hmm. we've used the word empty rhetoric or just say overly familiar ways of phrasing things. Could you tell us about what she said when people would ask, when were you saved? Oh, and this goes back to Christianity being a shared communion rather than the personal relationship with Jesus, which a phrase that doesn't appear anywhere in Scripture. So people would ask her, well, when were you saved? And she responded, when Jesus rose from the dead. Mm. Wow. So I, I, um, I actually have a question for the, questions for the two of you. Uh, um, uh, can, we check the can we check the rules uh -oh. on the podcast? I think we're almost out of time. Oh, gee. Oh, no, okay. um, <laughs> <laughs> no, so so I you know I feel like I'm sitting with the experts. So I what I what I what I'd love to hear from each of you is where where you see Lewis and Sayers being particularly rhetorical, um in maybe mm. places that I, I didn't mm. didn't talk about in the book. Mm. Now I'm going to let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've already kind of been talking about it. You know, Sayers. you could almost do, I think you could almost do a whole book on Lewis as a rhetorician. Yeah. And I'd love to take your opening chapters on, I mean, Augustine and Paul, and often the people who disavow rhetoric are the ones who are best at it. Mm -hmm. uh, even Augustine, he was a Manichaean until he heard this rhetorician who was disappointing. But then when he heard Ambrose, he got really excited about Christian faith. And I don't, I wonder if unconsciously he was responding to their rhetorical effectiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, but Lewis will, will say things like, let me just give this to you in plain language. One thing is he consciously spoke in the vernacular. Uh, someone would say, well, how do you use the word Christian? And he would say, oh, it's the old problem of the same word being used two ways. Mm. We, us professors would say, oh, it's ambivalent or it's, 
uh, it's an example of paranomasia, which is the fancy word for a word having. But just to say the same word being used in two ways. And his example back to this woman was, if somebody says he became a soldier when he enlisted, and the sergeant says, we'll make a soldier of you yet. It sounds like a contradiction, but obviously you can see the two different uses. And so he explains to her, in within orthodoxy, becoming a Christian involves accepting the creeds, uh, being in a personal relationship. But if somebody says, oh, well, that's not very Christian of you, it's a different meaning. Mm. But I love how he gave very obvious examples. He used a lot of imagination. Yes, You can write a whole book on metaphors in mere Christianity. Uh, that Jesus was like a strong man who had to bend way down to pick up the cart and raise it up on his shoulders. I think he may be thinking of Jean Valjean in uh, Les Miserables. Mm. So I would say the use of imagination and metaphors. Yeah. But you have a great uh, alliteration. You say that Inklings used to gather, get together for pints and pipes. That's right. <laughs> and just the musicality of that phrasing. He studied poetry so much that he would say, whether we're talking about corkscrews or cathedrals, uh-huh. we have to talk about the function. A corkscrew is not meant to open a tin of ham, and a cathedral is not meant to entertain tourists. But even choosing such widely differing examples, but they both start with the letter C, they alliterate. Yeah. That's a kind of intuitive rhetoric that you really can't teach. Mm-hmm. But I think you literally could fill a whole book with his rhetorical devices. Maybe we should get together and write that next <laughs> great, book. Great idea. <laughs> Crystal? Sarah's greatest strength became, I think, at times her greatest weakness in so far as she was so passionate about making the gospel message as well as the creeds understandable to other people that she would often use uh, slang terms from her own time. And it really worked in her own time. She got letters from thousands of people who listened to her BBC radio plays about Jesus, where she gave slang to the disciples, and even Jesus is talking about um, mm, candlesticks and things that, Mm. that didn't exist back then. But that created an image in people's minds, as you were talking about, Jim. Oi, oi, here come the Pharisees, that sort of thing. (laughs) (laughs) The trouble is, with slang terms, as we all know, they don't last. Mm. So I'm reading, there's um, something from Man Born to be King where a soldier at the cross says, or maybe it's Caiaphas, it's it's during the the torture of Jesus, and someone says, oh, quit your pie jaw. And I go, pie jaw? What's pie jaw? So I look it up, and it was a term used in the 1940s for pious mm. rhetoric, mm-hmm. you know, but, but empty yes. rhetoric. Yes. And once again, there's that. I'm so sorry I used the term That's rhetoric fine. in a negative way. <laughs> um, Can't, you could say. Right. And I, I constantly think she's making things up. Like she mm. refers to the overly pious as mugwumps. And I go, oh, that's such a great term. <laughs> and then I found out, no, that was a common term oh, for people yeah. who were in positions of power, but uh, they liked the power more than doing anything. Hmm. So mm. that's so, kind of. It's kind of like our discussion we had of Chesterton the other day and how he's, you know, so witty and very insightful, but a lot of his references are very dated. And so when you read him, you're like, well, I'm not familiar with the current events of 1920s England, you know, and so it kind of goes over your head. So So her translation of Dante's um, Inferno and Purgatorio, they were best sellers because she used contemporary rhetoric, but they haven't lasted. Um, although some professors still assign all her essays and notes for the Divine Comedy, yeah. but the translation Doesn't didn't. Yeah. yeah. So she spoke to her time. Power. Yes. Very exactly. well. Yeah. And and that's an interesting question about the power of rhetoric. Yeah. Are you seeking to speak to people today? Or are you going, oh, I want to be famous 20 years from now, which mm to me, is not something admirable. Right. Uh, yeah, I think the rhetoric is so much about timeliness. You know, 
thinking back to the two kind of Greek notions of time, Kronos and Kairos, right? Kairos mm-hmm. being the opportune time, and that's really the time of, of effective speech. Um, and that's something the rhetorician often aspires to, uh, to speaking in a chirotic moment or to creating this timeliness uh, mm-hmm. through their speech, to, making, making, to make something seem timely. Um, mm. so yeah, I think, I think the fact that, you know, she was speaking, um, in a timely way for the people, for her immediate listeners is, um, a very noble thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Jim, that makes me think of a question I wanted to ask you. Um, you bring this up in the chapter on Bonhoeffer, but in my head I was anticipating it because I was thinking of, uh, you know, in college when I was majoring in rhetoric and a lot of the classes that we were being taught, the assumption was people come to have dialogue and they give speeches because they're interested in the truth and they want answers and they want to debate, you know, and see which is the best idea. And then you walk away from the debate and you change your mind. Um, <laughs> you know, it's a very nice idea, but uh, increasingly the world seems to work less and less that way, uh, particularly on social media, um, seems to be people mm-hmm. talking past each other. And so in my head, I was thinking, and I was sort of anticipating what your comments in the Bonhoeffer chapter on the difference between the old rhetoric and the new rhetoric between persuasion and identification. And you actually mentioned Hitler in that chapter. And it made me think, um, you know, we do have a lot of examples of people who maybe have a negative ethos, have a poor ethos, Hitler be an example of one of them. And yet he was able to be very persuasive and people and generate this sense of identification. And I think we see that today. And it's interesting because we have people have access to Twitter feeds and Facebook and we live in this 24 seven news cycle and there's all these opportunities to persuade people. Um, and yet people are not necessarily interested in being persuaded as much as they're looking to identify with someone. And so that kind of made me think, how do you, how do you maybe see um, some of the things that you talk about in the book or maybe some of the themes being able to help uh, Christians and people within the church deal with this sort of environment that we're in? We, we, we're not in this old rhetoric environment of persuasion. We're sort of in this new one of identification where people aren't looking to be persuaded as much as they're looking to find someone who agrees with them. Mm-hmm. One of the big differences between the old and new rhetoric, uh, according to Burke, is the degree to which appeals are conscious or not. And so um, I think um, in answer to your question, part of what the rhetorical tradition offers us is a way to analyze the ways that we're being persuaded, both consciously and unconsciously, the ways we're we're, um, participating in um, kind of... uh, discourses with a capital D uh, that are shaping us in profound ways um, and not always for the better. Um, So kind of um, having the tools to be aware of that, to read our rhetorical environments is just crucial uh, for, for what it means to, to be a a Christian living, living now for Mm -hmm. sure. Right. Rather than just assimilate the yes. signifiers that are just floating around our heads and bombarding us, and we just start using them without thinking about them. Yeah. Yeah. Things like these phrases like uh, false facts, fake news, mm-hmm. and people use them as missiles to attack each other right. rather than to say, okay, let's analyze mm-hmm. things and say, you know, what can we legitimately say is happening yeah. here? You see that in um, actually in uh, like high school and middle school education. I have some friends who are teachers and they're actually having to do exercises in class where they're training people, uh, training their students of how to sort of tell what's fake news and what's real news and um, figure out lies from truth. And it makes me think, well, I mean, this is part of what rhetoric used to teach, but we don't really teach it in schools anymore. And so it made me think as I was reading your book, I thought this would actually be a really good resource for uh, homeschoolers or for Mm -hmm. Christian uh, high school uh, environments. You actually mentioned in the chapter on Sayers that she thought that um, students, I think it was like 9 to 16, should be educated in rhetoric. And so um, do you want to maybe comment on that and the sort of the function that that can serve? Yeah. So um, uh, Christian education at the secondary level in particular um, is one of the places where rhetoric is often still taught. Um, so 
um, it, it, it is, it is taught there. And, and, and Sayers, um, was an advocate, uh, of that, um, in her essay on, um, learning on schooling. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, I think a vital skill for young people, uh, to adopt and, and, and rhetoric was in some ways, um, the height of the, the trivium, um, of, grammar, dialectic, and then rhetoric. Um, so, um, you would learn grammar, then you'd learn logic, and then you'd learn, um, the art of persuasive communication. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's, I think it's an absolutely vital skill, um, to learn. If I have an eye opener, uh, I did exercise in my college class for college freshmen. This was back in Pennsylvania. Uh, is this a fact? Is this an interpretation or is this a value judgment? Mm. So my example was Dr. Downing was late to class. That's a fact. Maybe he got stuck in traffic. That's an interpretation. Dr. Downing needs to work on punctuality. That's a value judgment. <laughs> and then you give them 10 sentences, like it's too expensive to take a, a vehicle to Mars and talk about, is that a fact? Is that a value judgment? Is that an interpretation? And it's somewhat shocking that fairly obvious to me categories of fact, interpretation, or value judgment, they all seem like discussion questions to the students. Mm -hmm. So I had a feeling of, I think we're in trouble here. Mm -hmm. When people say fake news, what they're really saying usually is, I disagree with that, or that mm -hmm. doesn't fit my worldview. But mm -hmm. I, I don't know that that's something that's unique to young adults, though, because I think even older generations mm -hmm. uh, weren't, I mean, rhetoric hasn't been a major feature in at least American education for you know, I don't think ever. Yeah, um, but <laughs> I'm old and I never was trained in rhetoric. Yeah, yeah. So it, yeah, it, it, you know, currently it's 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 taught in writing classes, taught in communication departments um, at the college level, um, and you know that's one of the primary places where it's taught. But um, you know, I think having more of it for Christians in the church would be a, vi mm -hmm. a good thing. Mm -hmm. A good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Quintilian said that uh, rhetoric is a good man speaking well, and I believe you've modeled that for us today. Oh, thank you. So thanks for coming <laughs> and talking about your book and showing that rhetoric still is very much an important part of effective communication, especially for Christians. This has been so fun. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Thanks, Jim. All right.